Okay, good morning, good afternoon. Um, again, everyone, my name is Sanam Naragi Anderlini. I'm the director of the Women, Peace and Security Center at the London School of Economics um, and the founder of the International Civil Society Action Network, ICANN, um, that works with women peace builders all around the world. Uh, it is really a pleasure and my privilege um, today to be hosting this conversation on talking to extremists, uh, gender, power, and belonging with three extraordinary people who have been literally talking to extremists, um, not only since, you know, last month when, when all of a sudden in the, in the United States the, the insurrection blew up and, and people became, the public became aware of the extent of the problems here, but actually for over a decade, uh, if not more, are working on these issues around the world. Um, uh, we were going to have um, a, a dear friend of ours, Ashraf Mahmood, who was uh, um, from Pakistan, who, a former Brigadier General, but unfortunately he's been um, sick. And so uh, we are wishing him well. And in his place, we have his colleague and, and co-founder of the Payman Trust, uh, Musarat Badim, who's also a visiting fellow at the, at the LSE. So um, uh, Musarat, I want to first thank you for jumping in at such a last uh, moment to, to, into the conversation. Um, I know that that uh, I know that you're going to hit the ground running just because of, of, of everything that you've been doing and the experience you bring. But thank you so much for that, and, and we really wish that Chakpat will get well um, soon, thank quickly, you. and we'll have him on uh, at another time. Um, my my guests today for this second of uh, what I call the In Conversation series, WPS uh, Women, Peace, and Security um, at 21. Uh, so the coming of age of the Women, Peace, and Security agenda. Um, uh, my guests today are um, three colleagues and friends who have immersed themselves in the world of addressing different forms of violent extremism um, and, and actually engaging with the issues from the standpoint of trying to reach the people who are involved in these processes and bring them out. So the, wor the work around disengagement, um, some call it de-radicalization, we'll talk about the terminology and, and what all of this means. But, but really at the forefront of, of, of this uh, very complex, very dangerous area of work. Um, and uh, it's no surprise to those of you who know what we do at the LSTWPS Center that my guests are all women um, doing this work. And we will be talking a lot about the relevance of gender to the question of violent extremism, both in terms of the ideology of movements, in terms of the recruitment of men, men and women, how, how gender issues and gender uh, uh, dynamics are, are drawn and used by these movements, but also the very important role that women in communities, um, often at a very invisible level, are, do, are play in terms of the prevention of radicalization and the question of countering the, the problems and actually um, being the first ones to often warn against the rise of these problems because we see so often that women are the first to also feel and hear and see that the spread of extremism. So the, the role of women in this context is extremely um, important to us. Um, uh, so with that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start, start the conversation because we have a lot to get through. Um, my three guests, uh, Shannon Foley Martinez. Shannon uh, is currently working with at-risk communities in, um, in the United States. I think Shannon, you must be one of a handful of people who is actually dealing with directly groups that are, that are in the spectrum of extremist, neo-Nazi, white supremacist, and so forth. So um, thank you for, for the work that you're doing. And, um, and you know, you come with an extensive experience of having been inside one of these movements. So, so we're gonna hear from you. I wanna hear from you directly around um, that. And uh, amongst the other things that, that you're doing, you're advocating for protection of black, indigenous, Latinx, immigrant, and LGBTQ voices. So you really work on the question of diversity um, and, and Interestingly enough, a lot of what you do, you do voluntarily. Um, and, I, and I'd like to hear about, about that, that uh, the fact that for you, this is, on the one hand, you have this incredible expertise and people are drawing on your expertise and, and yet you're in your own work. So, so much of what you do is voluntary. And so, so why is that? Um, my second guest is Adia Khan, um, uh, who is a, a filmmaker extraordinaire, Emmy and Peabody Award winning um, uh, 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 filmmaker, documentary maker, and um, the kinds of films that Dia makes are quite extraordinary because when I met her a few years ago, she was in the middle of making a film about jihadis, um, uh, Islamist jihadis, and, 
and going in and talking to them. And, and we'll, sh we'll show a brief clip of that work. And then, and then that finished. And the next time I was talking to her, she said, well, I'm now talking to the white uh, supremacists and the white right. So, so we'll, we'll, you know, this idea of being somebody in the middle going in and talking to these, uh, to, to these groups. Um, but also the personal side of the, of, of, of what drew you into this work, uh, Dia. Um, her film, White Right Meeting the Enemy, um, was nominated for, for a number of awards um, and uh, won a BAFTA, I think, um, if I'm not wrong. Um, uh, she is the UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador for Artistic Freedom and Creativity, which is also extremely important in this, in this space. Um, and she's spoken at a, at a number of um, um, uh, events and, and, and live events. Uh, she has a TED Talk, which is amazing. She runs an, uh, an online a magazine called sisterhood.org, I think. Is it sisterhood.org or .com? But it's, uh, it's uh, a, a place where voices of women from Muslim heritage can be heard. And um, she has an honorary doctorate degree from Emerson College in, in Boston. Um, and then, as I said, Mosrat Fadim, um, co-founder of the Paymon Alumni Trust, um, really a pioneer in the work of prevention and countering of violent extremism, so PCVE work on the ground going back so many years, long before anybody even labeled um, this type of work, you were doing this. And uh, she is now an internationally recognized expert. She is a member of the um, Commonwealth uh, uh, Expert Panel on PVE. She is a founding member of the Women's Alliance for Security Leadership, WASP. Uh, she's on the review board of the Global Community and Resilience Fund, which is an international funding mechanism to get money to the ground, uh, grants to the ground for local community work on PBE. Um, and I could go on and on about the work that Mosra's done and, and what the, the kind of issues that she has um, framed and, and, and dealt with. Uh, she's also a member of the um, Commonwealth, Women of the Commonwealth Mediators Network as well. So, so the work, the mediation work that she does on the ground um, is now recognized also internationally. So um, I could have probably have pages and pages about your bios, but, um, but what I really want is for you to actually show us this through the conversation as opposed to me, me telling the audience. Um, and I'm going to start with Shannon, if that's okay. Um, Shannon, on January 6th here, here in the U.S., we saw the insurrection on the U.S. Capitol and all these guys suddenly running, and it was globally broadcast. We were all kind of live watching this event. Um, but... The images that we saw, the messages, the characters, and the and the and the sort of just the, the feel and the vibe of, of the violence and the anger and so forth. None of this was really new to you. You'd seen it all before, and and um, and for you know the audience might be surprised, but you had been inside one of these movements before, so so it was very familiar. Uh, can I just ask you what? What was you, how did you get involved? What, how on earth did you come into the world of white supremacy and neo-Nazism going back? And however many years ago it was, because you were very, very young. So if you could just share that with us. Thank you. In just like one minute. <laughs> My whole life story in a minute. Um, essentially, I grew up um, in a dysfunctional household um, where I experienced like complex layers of trauma um, that I, um, that I didn't have anyone, uh, to help me really like navigate through or even recognize that that was happening because on the outside, everything looked, you know, like my parents are still married, you know, from the outside, everything looked great. But inside I was really struggling and felt like I didn't really belong in my family and that my family was like not a safe place for me. Um, and then when I was 11, we moved halfway across the country and that sense of not really belonging anywhere expanded out into the greater world. Um, and so I was set adrift, kind of trying to find out who I was, where I belonged. Um, and in the midst of, you know, trying to posit that identity uh, at 14, a couple weeks shy of my 15th birthday, I was sexually assaulted by two men. And at that point, I didn't have any trusted adults in my life. Um, and so I took that trauma and just shoved it down completely unprocessed, which mostly manifested um, in my life as like very deep, like self-loathing and self-hatred and was expressed mainly through rage that I just wanted to hurt myself, which I did. I wanted to hurt everything and everyone I came in contact with. Um, in a way that I didn't have the skills to like process or deal with or even understand at all. 
Um, and in the periphery of, on the periphery of where I was hanging out mostly, I was hanging out at, you know, like punk rock, um, shows and stuff like that were the white power skinheads. And I think their rage within me really resonated with the rage that they displayed. And so I began hanging out more and more and more with, uh, with them and started listening to, uh, you know, the music that they listened to started reading some of the like books and zines and literature. Um, what I didn't realize that I was doing was that I was constructing an echo chamber in which I would be completely immersed and everything that I encountered would be filtered and normalized through that echo chamber. Um, and I would end up moving all over the United States, uh, staying with like different cells or groups of, of people, um, until, uh, I was 19 and I very luckily got taken in by, uh, a mom, uh, of a guy I was going out with who didn't share this ideology. What well, he did, but she didn't. Um, and it was within that context that I began to disengage, that my echo chamber was broken. She more effectively, like, met the the need set that I actually had and gave me some stability and stuff. And so by the time I was 20, I was uh, disengaged, um, which my, my life was still a disastrous mess, like after that, but I was no longer, I no longer identified um, with uh, violent white supremacist ideology. So, so, just, just, so, so a, from age 14 to 19, 20, that's, so that's a really formative time in anybody's life. And, and just the, the lady with whom you ended up living, did she know what you were going through? Like, did she understand it? Was it a conscious effort of her pulling you out? Or was it that she was just a loving mom and, and you, you decided that, you know, you felt that it was safe to, to kind of express yourself differently? I only found out a, maybe a year or two ago that she had no idea. She had no idea what, like, the ideology was or, or anything. Um, but, I mean, to her credit, it's like when I – there's a handful of pictures that other people have that uh, of me that have survived that time. And, like, I mean, if I saw me, I you know, I'd be very reluctant to be like, please come live with my – you know, 11 year old kids and my nine year old. <laughs> like, I mean, I looked rough. I looked angry. My eyes had, you know, the, the look of people that are, you know, that are just consumed with hurt and rage and anger, uh, in them. And so, I mean, I looked like the vile creature that I had become. Um, so, um, even though she didn't know that she, she decided to look at me instead as a young woman who was, hurting and in need of somewhere to be and to belong. Um, and that was it. That was the only requirement um, that she had for taking me in. So she, she was a hero and, and, uh, and, and did it actually through love, basically, to, to pull you out. That's absurd. Yeah, I'm glad that you're back with us just in time. We lost you for a second. Um, Shannon was saying that she got sort of drawn into this world at the age of 14 um, after very traumatic experiences. Um, and, and she was talking a lot about the issue of belonging and unbelonging and family and, and so forth. You've talked a lot about this and, and identity. Um, you've talked a lot about this as well. So what was your kind of exposure to this world of extremism and, and kind of how you encountered it? Well, what happened to you? So I encountered both uh, Muslim extremism and white supremacist. Uh, from a really young age, uh, on the, the, can you hear me all right? Can you t raise the volume a little bit? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and basically, well, I was, I was a child star in Norway and when I was a, a, a very, very young girl, I studied music and very quickly became quite public, um, in, in Norway. And as a result of that had some ferocious backlash against me because it was considered immoral and unacceptable for a young Muslim girl to be in, uh, engaged in music and being as public as I was, uh, that quickly resulted in uh, threats against my family and, and uh, basically cutting off my family from the wider community. Uh, I was targeted, my family was targeted, we were threatened, and as soon as I was around 13, 14 years old, the threat started coming directly to me. So I had knives pulled on me, I had people spit in my face, I had people uh, try to abduct me from my own school, I was attacked with pepper spray at my own, own concerts, it basically got to a point where I could not walk outside alone without a violent or an aggressive incident basically taking place. And this was, as you say, this was in Norway. This was not in Pakistan. This was in Norway. 
um, and it got so difficult um, uh, for myself and, and so dangerous for my family as well that at the age of 17, we decided that I had to pack my ba bags and buy a one-way ticket uh, to London. So that was my experience of, of, of that form. Um, and then the, the, the white supremacist side of it, from a, again, from a very, very young age, was exposed to neo-Nazi demonstrations in our streets, uh, in our schools. Um, I was uh, spat on in the face by, uh, by two grown white guys who told me to, to, to go back home wherever, whatever shithole basically I came from and people like me come from uh, and how people like me deserve to be exterminated and did not, do not belong in a country like Norway or across Europe. Um, my uh, family's friends, businesses and homes were targeted by racists. My brother's childhood friend was stabbed to death because of the, the color of his skin by neo-Nazis. So, so the, these sort of two worlds of intense, extreme expressions of rejection of somebody like me was very present in my life very, very early on. And it didn't really matter that my parents raised me with a sort of plural, pluralistic worldview, a kind of fusion worldview of you can be anything you want, doesn't matter if you're a girl, doesn't matter if you're brown, doesn't matter if you're Muslim, you can be anything, but the wider world very quickly showed me that that's not the case. So once I was in the UK and then I've also lived in America, uh, as I became more vocal about some of these issues, the threats against me have intensified. So I have, I have had to hide, I've had to, I mean, I had to leave my own country, I had to leave the UK for a little while as well. And these threats have consistently come from these two sides for me. Thank and you. The, to be honest, I always sort of uh, make light of it because it's, it's so ridiculous in some ways to me. <clears throat> and the police always say you need to take this seriously. But I just find it so incredible that the kind of threats that I get from both, whether it's guys claiming to be ISIS or claiming to be some white power, whatever thing, what they say they're going to do to me is the same thing. It's all sexual, it's all violent, it's all the various ways that I'm going to be cut and raped and killed, right? So to me, the slogans are different, their banners are different, their whatever, their, their window dressing is different, their packaging is different, but their message and their style is the same. Thank you. So, Mosarat, um, you've been doing this work, you're working and living in Pakistan, you haven't moved, um, you've chosen to stay kind of planted there and not only planted there but you keep going deeper into more and more remote areas and reaching out to more and more marginalized communities where various forms of extremism has kind of was seeded and then has grown and, and the air has has been kind of people are almost breathing it as, as, as you say sometimes what was your first what was your first interaction directly with with this reality that that had become in a way, part of your own society there? And how much of, you know, how, when you hear Dia speaking about Pakistani uh, community in Norway or in, in England, um, how much of that do you sort of see mirrored back home? Or, or even the white supremacy, kind of the, the types of issues. Um, how much of this do you see uh, sort of in, in terms of where you, you entered into, the, into this world of, of working on these issues? Can you unmute? <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Sanam. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening um, to everyone. Sanam, I think it's a, it's, it's a very difficult question because, you know, when the type of work we, we, we do, um, we didn't know we are going to end up handling, like, you know, a group of people who will be called so-called violent extremist or another uh, word, uh, the Taliban's. So it was, uh, can I just narrate a small story which actually led me to uh, engage uh, in this uh, sort of um, work. Um, we were actually working with university students. We were trying to help them in understanding the impact of the, the, the this conflict-like situation in Pakistan that was back uh, 2008 and 2009 and then in the process like you know we learned through them that coming to the university and working with us like you know and building our capacity is not enough because on the ground the situation is literally like you know changing on minute basis 
and the small boys like 14 and 15 years old boys know how to use weapon how to actually you know uh, put in explosives in the in the jackets and stuff like that and that was an eye opening uh, opener for us because we had no idea at that time that these young boys uh, are being used uh, by certain groups of people um, to kill their own people so we went into the communities and we started you know talking to some people and it was i remember i wanted to actually speak to a boy um, and he came up and he said my mother actually told me to put in uh, the explosives but i know how to actually you know make explosive that boy he actually had done his second year of the college at that time in 2000 uh eight i'm speaking about that like you know 2008 and he said okay and what your mother does and he said she actually makes the jackets she stitches the jackets and the boy um we just said okay let's let's like you know start uh, talking to so we said let's start, uh, start like you know engaging this this person who is is such a tender age is no know, he knows how to actually you know uh, make explosives and also knows the whole like you know technique technique of putting it in the suicidal jacket and all that stuff so when we started talking to him it was just like you know like an onion you know you are actually you know uh peeling it off and like you know with every new uh, uh i think you know the when you start uncovering you come up with a new story so we just said that yes this is the time we need to be actually engaging this youth who has been misled because unfortunately in the name of jihad which again is misinter uh, i would just say i can speak about it later on but in our case like you know it was totally like you know the the concept of jihad that was uh so convincing for both the the mother and the boy to engage in this sort of the i would say heinous uh, crime and we started uh, that was i would just say like you know a sort of the the beginning of our this long process of engaging ourselves with those whom we later on like you know try to help in the whole uh, i would say disengagement and transformation so that's like the the you know i i could just say that was the beginning of our work on working with the i don't i don't call them radicalized and i don't want to call them extremists let's see they were the one who were misled they were the one who were actually you know sort of unfortunately they were the one who were influenced to an extent that they were ready to kill themselves and kill other chat um shannon when you hear that and when you hear mosrat talking about she doesn't want to call them extremists or or um radicalized but the misled and so, and so kind of in a way as you know mosrat you're trying to sort of draw out the you think that at the core of it there is a human being that has been that kid was wronged and can be in a way right have some sort of right just treatment does that resonate is that do, do you see when when the with the people that you that you were with but also now what you know the kind of work that you're doing what how does how does it relate to what, what mosrat is saying um i mean we have to we have to have some words to use right so that's like that is that is the difficulty we have to choose words to represent complexities. Um I actually I feel I have a little resistance to some of that um because um I think the idea of having agency and having the words that that um that we use represents in some way that like yes I had multitudinous layers of trauma and yes I intersected with um you know collided with these ideas and communities and stuff but i also had agency in continuing to entrench and entrench and entrench myself further and further um that i had agency to do every horrible despicable violent act uh that i engaged in um and while it is definitely true and i think it is you know nobody's as of as of right now no one with whom i have 
worked with as they're, you know, disengaging has ever begun their story. Like, so everything was totally awesome in my life. And then I did all this. So it, to me, it's incredibly true that there are, there's nearly always multitudinous la- layers of trauma that on all kinds of levels, historical, societal, personal, interpersonal, like all, just all kinds of, of things that are happening there, which creates, um, you know, these vulnerabilities for someone to find resonance with utilizing violence or hate or this violent othering of others in order to like negotiate this system of like trying to feel connected to something that feels the closest they can get to uh, empowerment uh, or whatever. And so the, the words that we have to use are so to me are like, are so, so fall short to embrace that entire relationship of things where it's like, you have these people who are incredibly have deep vulnerabilities and don't have the support that they need to deal with them. Um, and then you have these communities and ideas that are in fact like, you know, targeting people just like that. Um, but there is still an active agency because everyone who has the life story that I had from the beginning of my life does not grow up to express that through hate and violence towards other human beings. So uh, I, I don't have a super good answer. <laughs> I have complex thoughts about it. Yeah, it, it, that, that's a really interesting point. And, and we often in, in the work that we do and, and engaging with, especially as women, it's, it's this question of saying, you know, I, I work with peace builders, actually, and, and uh, many of them have come into the world of peace building because of trauma, right? So, so it's like these mo- this, the trauma can lead you to do good work, or it can lead you to do, to become filled with rage and, 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 and vengeance and, and, and so forth. And, and, and maybe part of the problem is that out in the world, we don't have enough, we, the, the positive alternative side of the story of what you can do when, when you have a grievance or when you have aspirations or when you have this trauma, the, the positive voices aren't loud enough and present enough to say, come this way, you know, come, come to my world and, and we'll deal with it. And, and the negative ones are, are private, present and, and they're waiting or like vultures to sort of t- take you on. Um, so it, it's, so Dia, you, um, you decided to make, you decided to confront these people straight up that yeah. these people who, who, yeah. who, um, uh, who were threatening you. And, and as I was saying earlier in, in the pre, pre conversation that when we met, I was talking about how I get interested in the people who become peace builders in the midst of violence. And, and you've could constantly been drawn to the people who are violent in the midst of yeah. violence. Um, yes. we're gonna, we're gonna show a little sort of little clip of the two films that, that you've made and just this duality and how, how, how similar they are. Um, just, just, and then, and then we can carry on. Um, uh, Becca, is it possible to just, uh, screen the, the film? Al-Qur'an dasturuna, the Qur'an is our constitution. Wal-jihadu tariquna, the jihad is our way. And to die, to seek death and martyrdom in the path of Allah is our highest ambition or our goal. Last summer I met this man, one of the founding fathers of jihad in the UK. I fought on the battlefields of Afghanistan, Kashmir and Burma. I inspired and recruited I trained, I raised funds, I sent people for training, I went and fought myself, and it wasn't for just a one-off, 15 to 20 years. I just had so much hate in me. I wanted to kill or be killed. I've hurt people horrifically with my bare hands. I, I've beaten people until I thought they were dead and I left them in a bloody mess. I was a violent human being. I was the most evilest fucking diabolical person you've ever met. To break it down, people like me were egomaniacs with no self-esteem. That's what makes us fucking violent. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, my question is, how on earth do you get these guys to say this stuff? Like, you know, somebody sitting there saying, I'm an egomaniac, um, but with insecurities. I mean, 
men, one assumes that they're, you know, whether it's self, self awareness or, or just you disarm, like, how do, how does the conversation even begin? How, how do you talk to extremists? How did, for you, what was it like? I mean, for, for me, you know, as I said earlier, the, the reasons for, for me becoming very interested in men like this was my, my own personal experiences and also the realiz realization after several years that this wasn't something that was just affecting my life. This is something that was starting to permeate, permeate throughout various societies and that this, these movements are becoming more and more intensified and louder and are becoming more successful in their recruitment and not shrinking, which is, which is what I was told when I was growing up. You just have to give it time. Just look the other way and they will disappear and they don't disappear. So my, my way of dealing with these men like this before I actually decided to engage with them was to be afraid of them, was to act out of fear. And, and to, 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 to just want to have nothing to do with people like that. And in fact, I will shrink myself and I will hide so that you don't do anything to me. Well, my second response was dehumanizing people like that. And as I say, let me just look the other way and maybe magically they'll just disappear or go underground. And none of that, you know, was true. And none of that brought me any kind of peace or any kind of understanding of why does this happen? So I finally made a decision in my life where I, I realized that I would like to see if it's possible to seek these guys out and see if it's possible for us to sit face to face. And if it's possible for them to see my humanity and for me to find theirs, is it possible to, for us to actually find some sort of solutions and a way out of this through connecting with each other on a, on a human level? And, and, you know, the, what, what you said a little bit earlier is, you know, that you're drawn to, to peacemakers, you know, in, in conflicts in our societies and in our world, you're drawn to the people who, who choose to respond in that way. And I'm drawn to, or, or I'm running towards the, the people with the guns or who are doing the abusing. And, and I think I have actually thought a lot, a lot about this. And I think a lot of that has to do with wanting to get to the source of it. Because what the peace builders are doing, they're responding to something. They're responding to these people. What I would like is for these behaviors to stop or to be significantly reduced. So let me go into the, the belly of the beast and sit with them and see what we can learn. So, so how do I speak with them? It was very important in both films. And I've made films after this where I've engaged with armed militias in, in America. I've engaged with domestic terrorists and, and people who have, you know, blown up abortion clinics in, in America. So, and convicted terrorists. So, so the, the way to engage for me was standing in a, in a kind of posture of, uh, listening, being willing to listen to them, being willing not to engage on their premise, which their premise of engagement, what they're used to from people like me or people who hold cameras is that I, I shout at them my talking points and my kind of self-righteous positions. They get to shout their talking points at me. And so we sit there, we talk past each other, and then we pat ourselves on the back, each of us, and we go home and we accomplish zero. All we did was just state whatever, you know, we, our, our laundry list of, of, of views are, but we never actually listened. So I didn't want it to go that way. I wanted to listen and I wanted to make it, I wanted to make it possible for them to eventually also hear me. And the only way to do that is you have to allow for people to tell their story. And it doesn't matter how, for me, I was prepared that this was going to be very uncomfortable. This was potentially going to be incredibly unpleasant and potentially ugly for me, but that I have to keep my cool and I have to stay centered in that. And there's that I cannot allow for them to shake me off that and throw me off that. So let them finish, let, let them empty out whatever it is that they're carrying that they would like to say out loud. Uh, and after that, I found that something opened up in them that made it possible for them to hear my story. So, and what I did is that I didn't correct them. I didn't judge them. I didn't, uh, blame them. I didn't, uh, try to convince them to be like me. I just let them be who they are. And then I told them how I feel and what I've gone through and what, what, people who associate to their movements have done to my life and other people that I know. So that's, I mean, that's very, very brief and very broad strokes, but it was, it was essentially that is facilitating a space where they don't feel judged and attacked so that they can get comfortable with truly being themselves. And I was interested. I was desperately, desperately, sincerely curious about them. I actually want to know why they do the things that they do. I did not want to know what they do. I know that. 
And they're not used to that. They're not used to somebody actually being interested in them and in their life story. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to come to you. Uh, I remember you saying that at one point you had one of your colleagues who had been kidnapped or when they were doing humanitarian work and you, you had to go and talk to the local Talib. Um, tell us about what, yeah, that experience of how did they respond to you or what was the, how did you talk to them? What was the conversation you had with this guy who was renowned to be violent and and of course the world assumes that they don't they would never talk to women right so how do you go and talk to somebody like that and, and what what was the context yeah again a uh, few years ago we were working in the border areas uh, uh, with afghanistan it's called it was called federally administered tribal area uh, we were working on on health uh, project uh, and two of our uh, mobilizers were abducted by the uh, the the group, uh, the extremist group, or the Taliban's, uh, the local Taliban's. Uh, the the extremist leader was is is quite well known now, uh, and was quite well known at that time as well. Uh, so when I when I came to know, I was in Peshawar at that 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 day, and I said, oh, that's our responsibility because you know protecting them from such sort of. Like uh, we are, we should not be letting them like you know uh, taken away by the extremist groups. So I plan to go to the area which is called Bara, a uh, few kilometers, uh, I mean 40 minutes drive from Peshawar. But my colleague uh, in Peshawar he said, oh no, madam, you can't go to that area. Like you know, it's all under the uh, sort of the eye of the of the extremist group or the Taliban. But anyway, so we I'm going to be very brief about it because it's a very long story. So we finally reached the um, the the hujra or the men's quarter of that that leader. I'm not going to call uh, like you know his name. So uh, on the gate there was a man with there were two men rather of a, with like you know the clash and cough in their hands and guarding the gate. And I said like you know I want to go inside. And uh, he said no, you can't go. Uh, but there was like you know a big gate, and in this in the big gate there was a small door as well. So I just pushed that door and I went inside. Those men were trying to show me and like you know scared me with the with the guns and with the clash and course, But I just went inside, <laughs> and I found a very I would say like you know uh, a horrific scene because there were 40, 50 men sitting on the. We call them charpai, like the, on the beds. That's a usual thing. Uh, they were sitting there and had, having like, you know, everyone was like, you know, having a gun, the, the men with the beard. And I just saw them. Beard is like, you know, not scary for us because it is an Islam and we, of course, respect them as well. Uh, so I just like, you know, went inside. And when I saw all those 50, 60, 40, 50 men sitting around with the gun, uh, I got scared a little bit, you know, at heart, of course, like, you know, after all, uh, we have never been exposed to such sort of uh, scenes. So the man, one of the men, he actually covered his face with his, with his shawl like this. Mm -hmm. And I just realized that, oh, so this is the person I'm supposed to be addressing. Mm -hmm. uh, because usually, like, you know, they, they have never uh, seen a woman mm -hmm. coming uh, and with an exposed face to the men's quarter. Anyway, I addressed him and said, oh, brother. And I think that was the, the thing that I did the right. I did not realize I'm doing the right thing. But I just said, okay, brother, this is what has happened. I'm coming from this organization. Two of my, like, you know, the mobilizers have been abducted. So we had a long conversation. Not a conversation. It was a dialogue. It was, he started, like, you know, very aggressively, you know, you NGOs, you are actually, you know, working for the USA, the, the, the U.S., like, you know, interest here and stuff like that. And I had to convince him, like, you know, and I brought, like, you know, the relationship aspect into it. It was not the gender aspect. It was the relationship aspect that, you know, we have come here because, you know, we want to serve your sister, your wife, your ch your your girl child. And, you know, where in Islam it is forbidden not to cure for the, for the, for the illness. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, started quoting from the Quran. And that was so like, you know, it was not intentional. So it was coming out of my mouth instantly. Like, you know, this is what you really need to be, uh, you know, doing yourself. Instead of like, you know, we coming to you and serving you. And I think 
Uh, my point was quite convincing because I was not talking like, you know, from the culture as well, but I'm talking from the religion, like, you know, point of view as well. And the cultural one was addressing him somewhere and he responded and he said, okay, after like, you know, having a half an hour conversation, um, a heated uh, discussion, uh, dialogue with me and he said, okay, fine, we agree from today's onward, we are going to support Paman. Okay, now listen to all, all the 40 men he was addressing. It's our responsibility to protect Paman's personnel from today's onward on our soil. And I think that was my very first encounter with the type of person that we have heard of only. And I found a human being yeah inside that ferocious i would just say a uh, person who had been known for the killing of innocent hundreds of innocent people I'm going to come to that point point about what they've done but but the question of why they do it and how they do it um shannon right now in the u.s you know again after after january 6th the conversation has become so polarized and so binary and and this dehumanization that goes on um but as Dia and, and, and Mosrat are saying, we need to talk and dialogue and listening and deep listening. Um, and in a way coming at it, not initially from a point of judgment, but from a point of, okay, let me hear and let them hear me, right? So, so that kind of exchange at a deeper level. What do you, how do you do this? What do you do in the, in the States right now? And, and how busy are you? How many people are there like you in this country actually able to engage in, in this in this kind of work? Well, I mean, on the one hand, hopefully it's a whole lot of people because this is um, really, to me, the work of family members, friends, um, hyper-local support networks like psychosocial support and, you know, everyone that, that is uh, in a person's life. Like, the you know, me leaving... Um, had nothing to do with um, somebody like me. Um, however, it would have been very helpful to for somebody to have some information about, like, um, you know, some of the pitfalls and some of the, you know, some of the information that I wished I had had sooner, that it took me another three years after I left to even frame um, the sexual assault that I endured as sexual assault up until that point. I, it, the story that I told myself was just that I lost my virginity to two men at a party when I was 14. Um, so it would, would have been helpful to have somebody that had um, some greater knowledge of, um, of what I had gone through. And that felt like it was this, cause who do you go to and say, Oh, okay, by the way, um, I was a Nazi or whatever, like that, that, that didn't, that, that didn't really exist. Um, I, I think that there is, um, that there's a complexity of, of who is safe enough to be able, because no matter how much, how much policy we want to create, no matter what, like all of the security aspects that we need to like wrestle with or whatever, it's like without an interpersonal connection, people leave for incredibly personal reasons. They leave because their need set is being met more effectively. They leave through the conduit of empathy and compassion and somebody reaching down into, because it, it, I, I wasn't only dehumanizing others. I had also become dehumanized through that action. And I needed somebody who was able to reach down and insist heroically at, that I was human and reanimate me and rehumanize me um, as a process. And so uh, this has to happen in a very intimate ways um, on, you know, on the one hand, but um, in terms of um, you know, white supremacists and white power, white supremacism and terrorism and, and stuff like that, that, I mean, that we can't ask the victims and targets of this to love and empathy the abuse out of their abuser. 
Like, we can't just be like, okay, well, if you just love them enough, if you just love your abuser enough, they'll stop abusing you because that, again, you know, re-victimizes people who are already victimized. Now, individuals may choose to do that, um, which is an amazing and heroic thing, but I think in terms of of hashing out societal responsibility that um, in the American context, um, I, like, I feel incredibly strongly that this is very much the work of, um, of white people um, to do and reach in and rehumanize uh, those uh, that have just immersed themselves in the depths of dehumanizing um, black and indigenous uh, and, and people of color in our communities. And I mean, I have a particular, you know, I, I, this is about amends making for me too, that it's, you know, I feel a very personal responsibility to be somebody who can stand that gap and connect with others, you know, for whom it might be dangerous or unsafe uh, or re-victimizing for them to connect with. And I'm, I'm going to ask this sort of, 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 of all three of you. Um, we, why do, you know, Mostrat, you talked about the mothers joining or supporting. Um, Shannon, you joined and there were other women. I mean, we see other women that are, that are in these movements. Dia, you saw women that are affiliated with these groups. These are highly, in, in, in the work that we've done, you know, the, 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 when I look across extremist movements around the world, they are, there's something that the similarities is one is that they tap into visceral identity, right? So it's either your ethno-nationalism, your whiteness, or your Muslim identity. And it's like diminishing all other forms of pluralistic identity that we have and saying, this is the most important, right? But it's always tied with male supremacy. It's always, these movements are hyper sort of, sort of promoters of male supremacy. And yet we have women joining. So why do, why are women attracted? To these to these movements why are women joining i'm um, shannon from your standpoint like what what have you seen and and, and experienced and then we'll start like the mothers and, and stuff what, what do you see in that so um you know again framing through through my lens just to give it like a narrative um aspect was it was like here i was like um i what felt deeply disempowered in my life for multitudinous reasons. There was sexual assault. So I like, I didn't even feel like I had empowerment over my own body. So the messaging, my personal messaging was, you know, that I was worthless and that I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any worth or value on my own. Um, and there was this um, allure to, well, like, if I can't have real power, I can at least make people afraid of me. That it felt like this connection to something greater than myself, which itself had power that I would never have individually or whatever. Um, and there was this dichotomy where um, the so much of women's value is framed inside the movement as, like, you know, like – being sacred vessels to bring forth the new white nation and the, you know, the keepers of hearth and home and the passers on of tradition and everything. But nearly every interpersonal relationship I had while I was in the movement was incredibly, incredibly violent. Um, you know, very, you know, very physically violent and emotionally abusive and, and stuff like that. But um, on the outside, like I was, I was, I, you know, like I went, out with a few people, but I wasn't like super popular or whatever. And then I felt completely separated from being able to ne negotiate and navigate interpersonal relationships after I was sexually assaulted. Um, but inside the movement, as one of just a handful of women, it was like I had gained um, an ascendancy to power that I did not have on the outside. And so there's this adjacency to power that is incredibly alluring. And at the same time, in terms of um, the, the contradiction between the messaging of the worth and role of women and what was actually happening for me, that I didn't feel a conflict with that because I felt worthless. So the intimate partner violence that I was experiencing didn't challenge me at all. It reaffirmed what I already thought about myself. But it also reaffirmed that the violence that was being directed towards me would also be directed to anything or anyone outside of, you know, this 
in-group that was attacking me. And so, again, this adjacency to power was incredibly, incredibly alluring. And I didn't understand any of that until you know, until much later. Certainly, I didn't understand that, like, while I was going through it. But that it was, you know, that I, that, that, that I was looking for a means of, of gaining at least the, the illusion um, of power or empowerment in, in my life. Thank you. So, um, Mosarat, um, is, do you, this concept of adjacency to power and going from being unheard, worthless, or, or just sort of invisible in society, all of a sudden to having some influence and power, is that, does that resonate with the, with the women and the mothers that, that you've worked with over time? Like, how, how do they, what happens to them, you know, in terms of being recruited or feeling that they're part of a cause? Is it, um, why, do, why do they become embroiled in this? In the context of Pakistan, it's a very different story. Mm. Um, it's like, you know, the, 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 like I said, the concept of jihad was the most appealing, like, you know, uh, sort of a, an approach uh, that was strategically used by the extremist group to address the women and to attract the women. Uh, since it is in the Quran, of course, jihad is the sixth pillar, but then jihad is actually allowed under certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, these groups, these militant groups or these extremist group, groups, they use the word jihad like, you know, in a very different context. And like I said, I'm not going into the details of it. But they use it for their own means to convince and influence the mindset that like, you know, and I would just say the people who are so ignorant, but they are so religious, but still ignorant, like, you know, about the concepts of the religion themselves. Like I said, they love religion without understanding the religion. So, so, so the women... And that's our tragedy. Yeah, so, so the women... So the were women were convinced... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. The women were actually, you know, the sermons that were like, you know, uh, th that they would hear from the extremist uh, leader, they that was for the first time, particularly in one of the areas, it was for the first time, the extremist leader start addressing the women's issue through his Taliban's, like through the Mullah radio, through the radio. And the women of that area for the first time heard that, yes, their, their issues have a solution. In the Quran, their issues have a solution in Islam. So, like, that was the first time. The second thing was, his appeal was, like, you know, that, oh, you mother, you really need to come out and support us in this jihad against the infidels. And that appeal was so attractive. When I went to that area, the women would just tell me, oh, you have to listen to Armullah. You have to listen to this radio. And you will, you will also, like, you know, agree with us that we are right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. that's why, like, you know, a 60-year-old woman would go out and start raising funds for the extremists, like, you know, that mullah, that leader, without even meeting him without even, like, you know, getting into contact with him personally. So I think in our case, it was a very different situation. So it was like, you know, giving them the recognition that women exist. Women have an agency. Women have, like, you know, but that agency is only limited to the mother. Yeah. You know, her role as a mother. Contributing, like, you know, to, to the cause. To, like, so to the, to the, um, to, to the jihad, supporting the jihad, through, like, you know, raising the funds, giving the money, facilitating, like, you know, the, the uh, I would just say, induction of the new uh, blood into the jihad, that is the new, the, the youth into this jihad, jihad the so-called jihad, which is not jihad. Like, you know, now, of course, there is a fatwa on it, that jihad definitely, like, you know, are carried out under different circumstances. So that's why I said, R was totally based on misunderstood Islamic um, ideology. Misrepresented. Yeah, misrepresented. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yes. May I add to that a little bit? Because it's, it's so, so as, as we know, a lot of young women and girls have, have gone to join groups like Daesh, a lot of young Muslim girls. And I would say that what Musanat is bringing up has also been the case with a lot of those young women. But there are a lot of young Muslim women 
in, in, in the UK or in Germany or France or whatever. Why is it that this message that somebody, whether it's a mullah or it's a recruiter, or whoever it is, or somebody, you know, at the other end of Twitter trying to recruit these young women are using against them? Why is it that on some young women that works and on other women it doesn't work? So what I have found, at least in my work, is that it's a combination of what Musarat said and what Shannon is saying. So, so the reason why that message appeals is because there are those basic human needs in whether it's men or women, but we're speaking specifically about women right now, that are unmet in their own lives and in their own lived experience, that these recruiters, whoever, whatever shape they take, are actively and cynically exploiting and targeting and misdirecting, and as Musarat, I love your word of misled, actually is the right word, mislead these young people into becoming the cannon fodder for their own political uh, games and their own battles that they are waging for completely different reasons. It has nothing to do with Islam. It has nothing to do with inequalities or poverty in America. It has nothing to do with any of it. It's actually completely something else. And I have to, you know, some, a lot of the women that I spoke to in the UK in particular who were recruited into these movements have said similar experiences to Shannon. You know, one young woman told me that she was raped and she said she went to the, the, the courts and police and tried to seek justice in this country, in the UK, and didn't find it. Nobody stood by her. She went to her, our community, our Muslim community, and begged for help and begged for justice. Nobody believed her. Nobody supported her. Then this group appears and says, you come to us, and when the caliphate is established, you will watch him be hung in front of your eyes. You will get justice. So she was handed back dignity, power, and the biggest thing she was craving was justice. And to be believed, and these people believed her. And I have to, you know, always wonder, and I always say this, these three young girls, Sanam, you probably remember, three young girls from Bethnal Green that have gone and two are dead and one is, you know, lingering somewhere waiting to be claimed by a country. I always wondered, we always talk about what our young girls are going to. They're going to this barbaric this and barbaric that. I want to ask the question, what is it that they're leaving? What is it that is so bad? that they have to go. And, no and no young woman or young person leaves their loving, supportive, nurturing, nourishing, kind home. Nobody does that. So what is going on? And very few people are willing to ask those questions because it's easier to demonize these people that do these kinds of things. So the humanness of this is what has to be brought back in if we are to have any kind of success in addressing it. And, and, and that kind of, I'm, I'm really conscious of time because we can carry on, Sorry. but I want to, to segue because it's what are they leaving yeah. and going to. But what I found again in the years that we've worked internationally is the entire discourse um, globally is around countering terror, countering mm -hmm. violent extremism, preventing this, de-radicalizing. It's all negative. We want to be, we want to stop something. Yeah. We want to prevent something. But we're not actually saying what we are for. What are we offering? What are governments offering? What is, what's the alternative, positive alternative, right? And so, so as much as they're far, running away from something to go to something else, there is a question of what are they coming back to? And, and, and yeah. Shannon, is this something that you, like, we, when we talk about this, this going back to the terminology, um, I'm, I'm struck by how all of you, and, and including the work that, that I've done, we don't like to talk about just de-radicalization. We talk about positive alternatives, or I talk about the promoting pluralism. Most of all, you also talk about transformation. What does that, um, Shannon, what does that look like? What is, what is it that you, when you engage, what, what is it that you're trying to do, and what is it that you're trying to offer, offer these people to pull them out? I love Masrat's uh, framing as transformation too like i i like the po i really really like the the powerful positive framing of that um i for me it's uh, a sense of belonging to themselves um a sense of better identification and communication of uh their emotions and their needs um it's um a place where they feel like they can belong as they are, where they are, where they can be imperfect, um, and where it's okay to not have answers. Um, 
you know, I mean, for me, I mean, on a very intimate level, it's kind of like, just come be part of my family. Like I have seven kids and a stepson and, you know, I literally like, just come, just come be part of my family and let us like, just love you as you are, where you are. And let, you know, let me believe in a future for yourself that you cannot see yet and create a safe enough space for you to examine what has led you from um, the future that, that you should have and the past that you should have had. Yeah. And most, most, what, when you work with a young man and the women, does that resonate? Come and be part of my family, or, or you, you're creating another sense of belonging. What, what is it that you guys do on, in Pakistan with, the, with your Tolanas and others? Yep. We lost you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. You know, in our case, in our case, actually, you know, the the individual uh, they undergo sort of a metamorphic uh, murder. The extreme, extremists actually do the metamorphic murder of the individual when they try to change their whole personality into a very new person so that they can serve their cause. That's, so we understand that. So what happens to that child or what happens to that individual, they lock the fear inside. They are depressed. They are sad. They are socially isolated. So we have to actually address all these negativities. Mm -hmm and transform them like, you know, into something which is positive. It's a process. And that's why we don't call, we can't call it disengagement because, and we can't call it de-radicalization mm -hmm. because you are literally sort of not creating a new person, but actually you are transforming a person from negative to positive. You are actually transforming a person who has lost everything, including his identity, his thinking, his ability to live like, you know, peacefully and positively into something like, you know, which is a totally different person than what he had been during this process of radicalization or this pro pro process of like, you know, totally changed from one person to the other, which is very negative. So transforming his ability to think in a different way than the previous one is, I think, uh, is the task that we have been doing. And how we do it? Because it's not only, you know, working on his uh, psychology or like, you know, on, on his physiology, because physiology and psychology are two important things when it comes to transformation. The other thing is like, you know, giving him the recognition that he as an individual exists. He is not a group. He is not working just for like, you know, somebody's objective as a subject mm -hmm. he is actually an individual who has his own life or her own life and we have to give him again a cause in life because he has lost that cause in life so you have to give him a cause and that cause could be love for his family love for himself you have to start loving yourself and so love for himself or herself is so important. Mm -hmm. So we start with the self, then with the family, then with the community, and then with the soil. Because these are the four loves he has already lost mm -hmm. the feelings for. And you also do livelihood. So, so you're giving them a means to continue their lives. So yes, the cause is just to love himself, but also, yeah, you know, you need to give them the mean to live. Yeah. And that's through the empowering them, like, you know, economically and socially. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it doesn't end up there because social empowerment is so important for those people who have lost their recognition, who have actually, you know, being isolated by the community. They are being chased after by the agencies. And then you really need to bring them like, you know, yes, this is a new face of, of Akbar or like, you know, Irfan, these are the new faces and the new faces are the, the, the new faces are the transformed faces, which are now being respected by the community. And I remember one of the boys who was literally like, you know, when, whenever he would go back to his community, the people would start hitting him, literally hitting him. And they did not like him at all because he did a little bit of harm or he was isolated, like, you know, or like identified that they are, he's working for the other group. He did not do any harm as such. 
but then he was sort of like you know discredited for doing nothing mm -hmm. because he went to like you know the prison and he came back so we had to like you know give them the 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 a sort of an identity and give them the social skills to start working voluntarily in the community so you created volunteer networks of the so volunteer community. network was created providing him the platform to work from that platform which is called Peman's peace uh, tolana or like not peace we don't we can't call peace we call it Peman's youth tolana and Peman's woman tolana and then this platform actually give them the recognition that yes he can like you know contribute positively to the community he can work for his, for his country he can work for his society and i think this from nobody they become somebody thank you um, and that so i've got has, i think one recognition I have a bunch of questions and also including from, from the chat. So I don't know if we can go extra five minutes, but one question I really want to ask you is that, um, again, me working with peace builders, I often feel that peace builders are taken for granted, right? It, it's not as sort of somehow when we talk about violence, there's a, there's a sort of attraction to it because it's different. So we take that for granted. But what I, what I'm concerned about is people may be listening and thinking, you know, um, why are we talking about and, and kind of humanizing or trying to show empathy for these people who've been extremely violent? What about their victims? How do we balance that? And, and how do you deal with the fact that they have done horrible things? Um, and uh, in, in, in this kind of humanizing of, the, of, the, of these people who've been misled or they're extremists, um, are we forgetting the story of the victims? And and there's a related question, which is coming from, uh, from uh, Jessica Gruen from the um, Australian uh, Greens uh, uh, parliamentary group, where she says, how do you recommend bringing this humanizing factor into state approaches to extremism policy? So the work that you're doing, how do you scale it up, given that is so intimate and so individual um, uh, on, on, on this level? But so the question of balancing with the, the needs of victims um, but also, um, how do we take some of the approaches that you've taken uh, forward? And, and happy, you know, answer as, as you wish, or what, what, you know, from what you've seen. And, and Dia, certainly from what you've experienced and, and, and how things can change. Because um, I know that people that you've talked to have already stepped out of, of these movements, too. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I, I completely agree. I don't think that victims can be forgotten or lost in a conversation about this. Uh, but I also think that it's it's sort of uh, too simplistic to think that just because you have the capacity to listen to a perpetrator or try to understand what he, he or she has done in order to try to stop that behavior, that that means that somehow you don't also have the capacity to have respect for an incredible compassion and understanding and sorrow for what victims go through. But also, uh, of course, there has to be accountability. There has to be justice. There has to be consequences for that type of behavior. When I speak about uh, empathy, having empathy uh, or compassion for, for people who do awful things, that's not the same as sympathy. When I'm sitting and I'm speaking to these guys and I'm letting them speak and finish whatever it is that they're carrying with them, under no circumstances am I agreeing with them or liking what they're saying or giving them permission to think that this is a great thing to do to dehumanize other people. But I think where I have to draw the line, uh, and I really like Shannon, what you said earlier as well, is that it's not the burden and responsibility of victimized communities and populations to have to reform their abuser. So I don't think that that is a fair uh, uh, expectation at all. But I think, you know, where sort of, if I had to distill all of this down, where I've sort of landed on a lot of this is that, um, it's very easy to dehumanize other people, to dehumanize people like this, because they dehumanize us, right? But what we also forget is that they dehumanize themselves. They've also lost themselves in this process. And what I sort of refuse to do and think is a huge mistake is for us to contribute to that cycle of dehumanization. We also have to make a decision and make a choice as individuals and as communities and as, and as societies, what kind of people do we want to be? Do we want to be the people that, that because somebody behaves like that, we punish them, we humiliate them, we disgrace them, we demonize them and, and dehumanize them? Is that's, that makes it okay? Because that's what they do. I mean, what I have found is that the people that deserve compassion the most are the people uh, who need it the most, sorry, are the people who don't deserve it. You know, for me, I, I do a lot of work around human rights. I do a lot of work around, you know, dignity and compassion and, 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 and issues like that. And the values that I hold 
mean zero if the only people I'm willing to extend it to is, is you know, Sanam and Musarat, because you look like me, because I agree with you, because I like you. Th these values only mean and matter truly if I'm willing to extend it to people who don't deserve it. And most of these people have given up on themselves. And so we must refuse the impulse to give up on them as well, I think. Well, and I think in terms of like, if you look in terms of like restorative justice, right? Like, because justice is what we're, is, is the essential thing that we're talking about. It's incredibly important to center and amplify the stories of victims and targets, like that they have to be, feel heard and held and supported um, and not abandoned by, you know, empty justice or whatever. But in order for if we're talking about justice beyond just punitive measures and we are actually talking about how we reintegrate together healthfully to move forward, um, that we have to at the same time be willing to talk about what it takes and do what we have to do in order to reintegrate people into the fold, which is very different from not holding them accountable. Mm -hmm. Like accountability is vitally important and, and, and justice that feels like justice to the victims and targets, which we can only get to if we center and amplify their stories mm -hmm. in terms of like policymaking. I honestly, like, I don't think you can, um, so, <laughs> call me a cynic. So I think in terms of like state policy that, that a better role is, um, funding, um, very, you know, local grassroots community led efforts who are better able to identify, um, their very local needs and connect people, you know, and, and, and state's role can also be to create an environment where it's easier for people working from multidisciplinary areas to connect, share information. There's lots of programs that are doing amazing things that hit exactly what I'm working on that I have been doing work for 20 years and I've only just heard about it right now. And so I think that that can be state's role funding, creating a messaging that this is important, that if we are going to move forward as like holistic societies, we have to figure out how to stem the tide of people um, looking to extreme violence uh, as part of the expression of what it means to be in our nation. Thank you. We have, I'm, I can't finish without um, bringing it back to the question of having women leading these efforts. Like what does it, what does your identity as, as a woman, as you engage with the white supremacists, as a filmmaker, with the Taliban, how does that play into it? How do you use, how do you strategize around your own identity? Um, uh, uh, and, and how do they, you know, how do they react to, 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 to a woman coming and in effect not challenging them in an aggressive way but actually questioning and, and, and creating a space so so that the gender dynamics of of being at the in in the realm of this leading transform transformative work so, so that that's that's one question and and most of coming you know th there's a particular question around is peacemaking a particularly western concept is it, does it, does, you know, <laughs> is it, is it just something that happens in the West or is it, is it something that we also see in our world? So, so, so as you answer this question of the role, as women leading this effort, what, what do you do and how do you, how do you draw on, on your um, identities, but, but also whether, whether we have these differences in terms of East and West. Um, uh, Dia, do you want to, do you want to kick, kick start that with, with, you know, as a filmmaker and, a, you know, going, going and talking to these guys, uh, what happens? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just, just very briefly, if you don't mind, you know, the, the point that you just brought up about is, is peace Western or Eastern or where, who does it belong to? You know, I know that there's a lot of, you know, has been a lot of talk around, uh, you know, are women on the ground peace builders instrumentalized? Are they just being funded to do PVE work because whatever, whatever, all this sort of weird, suspicious sort of language. And I have to be completely honest and a bit blunt about this. I find that to be an incredibly uh, racist. Uh, incredibly sexist and an incredibly sort of neo-colonial, colonialist, uh, um, framing of something like that. Because what those types of statements mean to me is that you somehow think that women who are brown or black 
do, or do not have agency and do not have the heart or the brains to care about their own communities and want to piece back together whatever their their societies have been destroyed, both from within and from outside. So I, I find it uh, a, a, a ridiculous proposition and a ridiculous, uh, uh, it's, it's insulting. I find it incredibly condescending. Um, so, but going back to uh, what was the extremist no, question? I'm you, as, as a, you know, when they face, when you go face them as a... Yes. What, what was the importance of being women doing this work of talking to extremists? I mean, so, so my, from my very sort of, you know, personal experience, the way that I was viewed in, in both or multiple of these movements that I've gone into is because I am a woman, uh, I was, uh, and I'm used to this from other contexts as well, but, you know, I'm completely underestimated because I'm a woman. I am not perceived as threatening in the same way if I was a man walking in with a camera. And therefore, the behavior of the men that I was speaking to uh, was, was, was different. Our, our starting point was different. And I think because they underestimate me and because I'm not threatening in their eyes, um, they felt safer to come out and be themselves and, and felt more comfortable speaking about feelings and their own stories and their own personal experiences and allowed me to be with them in that because they didn't feel like the premise of our interaction and our dialogue was domination or humiliation or chest beating or this kind of hyper masculine, um, uh, this sort of need to, uh, equalize whatever emasculation they feel. Right. So in front of me, they're, they're better because, like you said, male supremacy is such a huge part of this. So I, I would say being a woman uh, made it in some ways easier for me to to speak to men like that. But of course, it also made me excruciatingly vulnerable, too, because, you know, I was pregnant during one of the films and I had people pull guns on me and, and you know, threaten to to end me there and then. So it's, you know, so it's a double edged sword. <laughs> Definitely, I would say. Shannon, uh, do they underestimate you? At their own peril? <laughs> um i i <laughs> yes um, like i i was thinking it well well uh dio was talking too that it's that it's um the perception of me making myself vulnerable which i think actually allows them to um make themselves more vulnerable to feel safer being more vulnerable because they already see see what I'm doing as this act of vulnerability. Um, uh, and I mean, I don't know. I've had, I've had nine babies. Like, <laughs> I'm just kind of like, what are you going to do to me that like hasn't, hasn't already happened, right? Like, so, um, you know, so I, I, the kind of strength that I have is the strength that they haven't really encountered mm -hmm. um, in their life before. That the ferocity that I have to be able to see past all of their bullshit um, and care anyway yeah. um, is something that they probably have never, ever yet encountered yet. And it turns out that that's way more powerful than all of their, like, ego gun supremacy, you know, craziness. And, and Mosarat, you said you, you you faced off forty of these guys in the first place anyway. But but you know, last word to you around this question of you know is peaceful peacemaking east or west or are you know are you the are you an instrument of some western insidious government in Pakistan um, doing this this kind of work? You know, to, to Dia's point about um, the the recognizing the agency and the strategic thinking and 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 the heart that comes into your work. How how do you how do you explain women doing the work of countering violent extremism and, and transformative work in your work, but also in the networks that you know and so forth. Sorry. I'll be the last person to be actually, you know, the instrument of the West, because <laughs> I think peace, peace actually, you know, emanates from us. Mm -hmm. Because in Islam, in our history of the subcontinent, in our religion, actually, you know, it's all about peace, and women have played like you know historical role in bringing communities together and resolving the conflicts. Not like you know intra community or intra interstate, but of course like you know intra uh, I would say sex as well. So that has been like you know my history. That's what I'm proud of, and that's what actually you know I usually refer to in my work when we do that. 
Yes, in Pakistan, the role of women as a peace builder and peacemaker is not recognized by the state and naturally followed by the others as well. But we as women, we have been doing this work for the last, like, you know, so many decades. And we, we, we have made it very obvious to the people that when a woman is in the field of conflict resolution, nobody can challenge her skill if she has the knowledge and if she has the ability to prevail upon this whole process. So I think it all depends on who is doing this work. It's not like, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very simple work, but it is actually, you know, an, it's a very difficult uh, process to be engaged in, particularly in a country like ours, where women agency uh, is not, I mean, women are not recognized in this role. And peace building, peacemaking and conflict or war is considered as like religion as a domain of men. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to refer to our religion from time to time. We have to refer to the history of Islam. We have to refer to the history of the subcontinent and history and, of course, the tradition of Pakhtuns and, of course, the culture of Pakistan, where women have actually, you know, ref uh, diffused the tension between communities. They have put an end to decades-long uh, feuds between, between the tribes and between the communities. So that for us, that is very import important and Actually, we need to project it more. And people like us who, who have actually sort of like, you know, being the victim of the situation because we have not got the recognition, we are fighting for this recognition for others, Thank for, our, for our next generation. That this women, the women are so important, they are so crucial, uh, critical, like, you know, for bringing in peace in the communities. And I think that's what our fight is again, like, you know, not the fight, but I think that's my cause. And that's Thank what you. I'm working for. Thank you very much. We are literally 10 minutes over time, um, but this has been extraordinary. And um, to, to those who are looking for a policy answer, I would say what, what Shannon said work with the local, support the local organizations that are locally rooted, connect them across countries and fund them to do their work because they know what's happening. Um, and, uh, and more importantly, I guess the simplest answer is if you want to understand and deal with extremists, talk to women who are already de dealing with this work. So thank you very much for this amazing conversation and for giving us your time and sharing so much from your heart and your soul and, and everything. Um, uh, the recording will be available soon on our website as a podcast uh, and a video. Um, please share it. And we will be back with a third of our WPS um, Women, Peace and Security coming of age series uh, at the end of March. Uh, so stay tuned and sign up so that you get the notices and we'll surprise you with what the next topic is in the same speakers. Thank you, Dia. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Mosarat. It was awesome. And hopefully we'll do this in person one day soon. Um, Inshallah. Thank so, you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.